Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, my name is Kathleen Morgan and I'm the Director of Development and Community Partnerships at Lawrence Public Library. Um, we are so excited to have you at our Downsizing 101 program today. Uh, this event is part of Lawrence Public Library Friends and Foundations Retirement Boot Camp and Before You Check Out programs. Um, our next program in this series happens on July 16th. It's in partnership with AARP, the Douglas County Senior Resource Center and Community Villages of Lawrence. Uh, the name of the program is Stay One Step Ahead of Scammers. Um, as you might know, um, scams have been on the uptick with all this COVID-19 situation. So the class will teach you how to avoid scams and what to do when fraud happens. Uh, so look for more information on the library's website and uh, we can also, we'll, we'll probably send you an email about it as the date gets clearer or closer. So just a few housekeeping details. Uh, we are obviously hosting you on Zoom th uh, this afternoon. Um, everyone is muted for the time being. Um, we'll have our guest first make his presentation, have a, a conversation with um, our interviewer and then we'll answer your questions. Um, in order to fully participate, uh, please familiarize yourself with your screen. Um, you'll see the chat button, at least on my screen, is at the bottom. Other screens, it's at the top. It's the one with the speech bubble. If you could submit your questions there, that would be really helpful uh, to us. And then we'll also send you important information like the link to where to buy the book and other information. Uh, the other buttons you'll want to be aware of, um, are on my screen anyway, the buttons at the top, one says speaker view and one says gallery or gallery view. And when you hit speaker view, you see me, um, a big version of me, because I'm talking. If you hit gallery view, you get to scan the whole crowd and the little arrows on the side will help you switch from screen to screen. So um, for the beginning part of the program, when our guest is, um, making his presentation, the speaker view is probably the optimum, optimum view for you for this particular um, situation. Um, at some point, we will probably also take live questions from the audience. So if you would like to ask a question that you did not put in the chat, just wave your hands, uh, make yourself known, and uh, we'll be scanning the crowd and we'll um, kind of talk to Kathy to um, have you, we'll unmute you and let you answer questions. I also wanted to pass along that we are recording this evening's program and it will be posted on the library's YouTube channel afterwards so you can come back and um, watch it again. So our guest today, Dr. Dave Eckert, just released his brand new book, Downsizing, Confronting Our Possessions Later in Life. If you'd like your own signed copy, The Raven is happy to get you all set up. Uh, the link to The Raven's website is in the chat. Um, there is a print version of the book available to check out from the library. And in addition, uh, we also have the digital version available through Hoopla, which um, requires no waiting. So uh, lots of different options. Um, if you're interested in the library version, you'll find it in our catalog. So I am delighted to introduce our interviewer today. Kathy Hamilton is a former Journal World reporter, author, and a playwright. One fun fact about Kathy is that she is the creator of Boyfriend in a Box, which is a novelty gift uh, product that landed her on the Today Show in People Magazine and as Kathy Hamilton number three on To Tell the Truth. Uh, Kathy <laughs> currently serves as Lawrence Public Library's Retirement Boot Camp Drill Sergeant. So please help me welcome Kathy Hamilton. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, everybody. And thank you, Kathleen, for that uh interesting introduction um well i'm so thrilled first of all to see so many people here uh it looks like we have 48 so far i know that 60 plus had registered so hopefully we'll see them um pretty soon it's been a it's been a topic very near to my heart and brain lately um since my husband and i started last fall thinking about and actually executing our version of downsizing. Um, we had decided we probably should think about moving to a smaller house. We didn't know where exactly. Uh, we had no idea where, uh, to be honest. But we had gone as far as to interview realtors, get a punch list for things we needed to do to this house before we could sell. Um, and then we started 
getting rid of our things, um, from insisting our adult children um, come get their stuff out of our attic because they don't have any storage space um, to speak of. But, but our son actually did move into a house, so okay, you gotta come and get it. So we insisted on that. We, um, we donated a lot of stuff, and then I started selling stuff on Facebook Marketplace, which I can talk to you about later if you want to, um, and sold just like $2,000 worth of stuff like that, just big tools and things my husband had. And then the pandemic happened and all bets were off and now we're sort of in a holding pattern, but it's still in the back of our minds. And, and if only I had read this book of, of Dr. Eckert's before that, I think I would have felt better about the whole thing because it really was kind of an emotional roller coaster of sorts and uh, kind of exhausting in a way. So um, I'm hoping that, that we all will get some, some good insights uh, from Dr. Eckert and, um, and some practical advice on how to pull this off because it, it can be a, a real stressful life event. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our guest today. David Eckert is a professor emeritus of sociology and gerontology at the University of Kansas. He studies the transitions of later life, uh, i.e. retirement and residential relocation, and ways that older adults make themselves ready for the future. He's been a journal editor, encyclopedia editor, and held leadership positions in the Gerontological Society of America, or GSA, the American Sociological Association, and the American Society on Aging. He served as the 2018 president of the GSA, the nation's oldest and largest interdisciplinary society for research, education, and practice in the field of aging. And I want you to know that under his um, signature line on his email, there is the quote, everyone is eventually a gerontologist. So without further ado, um, Dave, welcome to our program today, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, and I welcome uh, uh, your questions, Kathy, but also as we're going along, I welcome uh, the observations of people who are listening in. It doesn't always have to be a question. It can be a, a comment on things, uh, might take us in a new direction, thinking about this in a new way. So. Uh, Let's get going. Yeah, so to that end, um, if, you, if you see the chat bubble, as Kathleen um, said, that use the chat just to send a question or comment out. I'll see it, uh, Dave, Dave will too, and we can um, hijack this conversation if it, if, uh, if it feels like the right way to go, and then afterwards we'll have a Q&A so you can get your questions um, asked and answered. Um, so first off, Dave, this whole idea, this concept of downsizing and this wrapping your head around um, getting rid of your material possessions that you've accumulated your whole life, is this, is this like a modern thing? Is this like modern anxiety and, um, or, or what? Well, it is since World War II, we increasingly live in a consumer society and we are defined by the material that we have and the material that we consume. We get more and more of an identity from this. Every generation actually is more intensely put down on um, the identity that probably comes from their possessions. But I was visiting in, the, and I recommend it to you when the world opens up again, I recommend to you the National Frontier Trails Museum in uh, Independence, Missouri. And I was there and I saw something and I thought that is so relevant to the topic we're going to talk about. If you don't mind, I'm going to uh, take over and flash a, a few slides to tell you this anecdote from about um, something that happened on the Oregon Trail in 1846. It's something about a rolling pin. So the trailhead of the Oregon Trail is in the Kansas City area. Where the, these are where the wagon trains formed up before they headed out west. My house in Kansas City is about a block away from the route that the trail took across the Kansas City area. There, in fact, is the sign on the street, um, just up the street from me. 
And my office at the University in Lawrence is also about a block away from the trail route as it passed by, well, there was no Lawrence in those days, but it passed by the area on its way through Eastern Kansas. So the person telling the story is named Lucy Ann Henderson, and she was a girl of 11 when her family started off across uh, on the Oregon Trail in 1846 in the spring. It was an arduous journey of several months, and along the way, one sister died and another sister was born. The family eventually reached the Willamette Valley in Oregon around Christmas time of that year. Now, Lucy Ann, put this up here, Lucy Ann um, would live there for the rest of her life. Make this a little bigger here. Lucy Ann would live there for the rest of her life. She married and raised four children, and she died at the age of 88 in 1923. And just toward the end of her life, a journalist approached her and asked her about her experiences in that year of 1846 on the Oregon Trail. And she told this story about something that happened, uh, took place in the area of present day Idaho. And she said this, at a meeting of the men of the wagon train, it was decided to throw away every bit of surplus weight so that better speed could be made. A man named Smith had a wooden rolling pin that it was decided was useless and must be abandoned. I shall never forget how that big man stood there with tears streaming down his face as he said, do I have to throw this away? It was my mother's. I remember she always used it to roll out her biscuits and they were awful good biscuits. And according to Lucy Ann, that man was known for the rest of his life forever after as Rolling Pin Smith. And I think there are worse things than being nicknamed for, you know, a memory of your mother's care. There are three things in this story I think are a good introduction to this topic. The first one is, of the two re main reasons why anybody has anything or keeps anything, it's that they tend to, is that the thing is useful. So in this case, it's a rolling pin and you can roll out biscuits with a rolling pin. And the second reason that people tend to keep things is that it symbolizes something. In this case, it symbolized his mother and her love for him and her care of him. So both use, usefulness and symbolism are wrapped up together in Mr. Smith's reasons for valuing that rolling pin. The third thing is, sometimes there's a need for better speed when we may be over-equipped for the next stage of the journey. We cannot accommodate something no matter how useful it is or dear to us, but there can nevertheless be tears in divesting it. So our possessions today are not so minimized as they were on the Oregon Trail of 1846, but we too are conducting entire households of goods across time and place. I think it's important to think about the entirety of our things because we tend to think about um, individual special things or cherished items, but this is gonna be a story about the entirety of things. So I think a lot about possessions, and I think that's a good orientation to the question. Things are useful, things are symbolized, at the same time, can we continue to accommodate it all? Great, so let's talk, uh, because I think it will be useful um, in the conversation too, is this metaphor you use of the convoy. You yeah. say there is a social convoy and then a material convoy. Can you, can you explain what you mean by that and how that, what that looks like? Well, there are two, um, there were, it, it, it came out of psychology, it came out of social psychology and my friend listening, Mary Lee Hummert, would be is most familiar with this. The idea of a social convoy of family and friends and acquaintances, an envelope of people that accompanies us across our entire life. People join the convoy. People may leave the convoy. Some things in the people in the social convoy are more important and less important. So analogously, we have uh, we came up with this idea of talking about a material convoy that accompanies us across our entire lives. When we're born, we're, 
instantly introduced into a small material convoy, a nursery that has clothing and personal care supplies and perhaps toys. And that convoy has an entire life ahead of it. Some things are more important. Some things are less important. Some things are completely forgotten and completely mysterious. Like you don't even know what's under your sink, do you? Does anybody know what's under your kitchen sink? No, you don't even know what's there. You do. You know everything that's down there? Well, that's amazing. There's other things in the convoy that belong to my, like for me, belong to my wife. So they're quite mysterious. I don't know what they are. But nevertheless, we're shepherding this mass of material across time. And, and some things come and some things go. But what happens over time is that things tend to accumulate in the convoy. And the question becomes, can we continue to accommodate all of these things? One other thing I would say about the convoy is we often have two minds about, about it because there are things that are a comfort and a delight and they are just give us happiness. All of those things, yes, but at the same time, they can feel like a burden to us all at the same time, kind of like your in-laws. You love them, but you couldn't live with them if you had to. Well, and what we're going to talk about a little later is when those two convoys meet and merge and the divesting of some of these things and how people and things get all uh, tangled up and that can be fraught with issues. So, but let's say that for just, just a minute. Yeah. Um, you, you did a survey in which I believe, I, I might not get these numbers on the nose, but um, I think it was at least 60% of us when asked, 60% um, of us feel like we have too, too many possessions, um, yeah. m more than we need. Yes. And, oh, go ahead. Well, we were fortunate to put some questions into a national survey um, that's ongoing, and we could add added these questions. And our question was, you know, where you live, uh, do you have, do you feel at your home, do you feel that you have more things than you need, fewer things than you need, or just the right amount? And I know all of you listening are convinced that 100% of people would say they have more things than they need. The, the real answer was 60% of people over the age of 60 said that they had more things than they need. And about 35% said that they had the right amount. Well, that's translates, if you apply that to the American population, 60% more things that I need, that comes to nearly 40 million people over the age of 60 saying that. And that is more than 10% of the American population. That's a heck of a, if you're interested in getting into this as a, as a business, that's a heck of a market for advice and services, 40 million people thinking that they're over-provisioned. And so I'd, it also raises the point that there's no reason to scold and shake our finger at older people because, well, your houses have too many things in them. They already know that. No point, no point in piling on. And yet, didn't you follow up with another question? Um, once people had relocated, once they had you know, moved to a smaller place, they st still, wasn't it like 40% still yeah, said 40, they had more than they needed? People who moved in the last two years, 44% still said, I have more things um, that I need after having moved and presumably downsized. And they have tubs and racks and boxes of things out in the garage or in the back bedroom. I know because I've been invited to go see them. Um, we still have these things to go through. So sort of our confrontation or our, our managing the material convoy really never ends. It's always an ongoing thing, but it really is acute at this, at this time that people decide to relocate. And that to me begs the question, are there are there certain personality types that do better uh, at this, with this, downsizing this, um, I don't know if it's a mindset, maybe it's previous life experiences. Did you learn anything about that in your research? Well, most, most of the, uh, the, the large national survey, we couldn't find personality traits associated with, um, associated with the management of possessions. Um, neither could we find uh, male or female gender traits associated 
with the feeling, for example, that we, I have more things than I need. Men and women answer about the same way. For the people that we interviewed in, our, in their homes, we didn't make a personality test. Mm. So I, I can't really say, I would just be speculating. I want to talk about how you did the research for the book. I know that there's, there are a lot of stories. You listen to a lot of stories. There are stories quoted in the book. And, and, um, and in fact, I love the way you even put the names, I think first names and ages of your subjects in the book itself at, at the end. Um, in addition to these survey questions and all, uh, were you the one listening? What, did you have a team? How did that work? Yes, there's a team of us have been studying probably for 15, over 15 years now, um, interviewing people in households, people who had moved, who were about to move, and sometimes we even interviewed their family members to get a second perspective on the move. All together, I think we've interviewed people in about 130 households, both in the Lawrence and Kansas City areas, and also in Detroit, because I had a set of partners out in Detroit um, who could get um, interviews with, uh, uh, were able to get interviews with, a, with a, an urban population. Once, when we started on this and we sought funding for this research from the National Institutes of Health, we ran into an objection, which is that downsizing is really only a problem for affluent households. So we said, okay, well, we can check that. Um, and so we have a good range of people that we talk to. I can assure you that this is a problem or a predicament that extends far beyond affluent households. What, and, go ahead. And so what is that common de denominator? What is, in your mind, the biggest challenge in that that sort of unites us all across, um, across all categories and, and pay scales and classes, what is, what, what is the common denominator then that makes it a, such a huge predicament? It's the, it's the accumulation that occurs over time um, and the, the uh, not pruning it as we go along. Um, there are all kinds of reasons to keep things, many, many reasons to keep things, largely because we live in ever bigger dwellings that accommodate more and more things. This one of the late w women in our sample said, uh, um, have you ever seen a clo an empty closet in anybody's house? And another one said, drawers are for filling up. And so many people were puzzled at what they had. And it didn't matter if they lived in a modest house or an affluent house. I don't know where all those things came from. I don't know how I acquired all of that. Gee whiz, wait till you're 80 years old, somebody said to one of, my, one of our interviewers, uh, see what you got, gal, see the problems you're gonna have, gal. And uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a common human thing. And it doesn't mean that we're pack rats necessarily. I think we just go about the business of life being parents or um, partners or sports enthusiasts and we just accumulate things and just going about the business of life. And um, the challenge then is when you reach later life is to make this convoy of material proportionate the kind of life that you're living. So it sounds to me as if you're advocating for a sooner than later scenario. Uh, is that always the best case? Uh, is that always the best way to go? Well, we asked our people at the end, you know, what advice would you have for, um, you know, other people your age or facing a move or right now or sometime in the future and they all said right down the line start early do it while you still can implying that there would be a too late a point of too late uh point and and they said get help and pay for it if you have to get help and pay for help if you have to i i second that idea of advanced downsizing because it uh, gives you more control um, you have more time to work out optimal divestments. So you can wait until next May, for example, until some niece's wedding and you can give her just the right um, platter or, or gift or something that from your, we'd like you to have this. You can cultivate recipients for your gifts. You can, you can have the time to have, uh, for example, sales processes play out. Sometimes it takes months to get the price 
that you'd like for something. And this is not gonna be possible if you have to move in two months. Um, it gives you privacy um, if you're doing it over an extended period of time. There are things in your house or your home that should never be held up for inspection by family members or friends if they're helping you. You just don't want them holding those things up. May I also say, while you're downsizing, just on the side, it's not really a material thing, but also clean up the hard drive on your computer. Uh, take care of that so that it protect your privacy. And finally, I think doing it in advance um, is helpful because we have to keep in mind people's physical energy and their stamina for doing this. Elsewhere, I quote numbers about, that have been asked of older adults, uh, whether you have any difficulty, for example, stooping, kneeling, or crouching. And people in their 70s, about half of them say that they have difficulty stooping, kneeling, or crouching. And among people in their 80s, it's up to two thirds have difficulty with that. So imagine cleaning out a house without stooping, kneeling, or crouching. There could be a point of it being too late. Another question that was asked, could you lift or carry something that weighed as much as 10 pounds? And about a quarter of people in their 70s now say that they can't do that without difficulty, which rises to almost half of people in their 80s being unable to lift a weight of 10 pounds. And if you think about boxes and moving, um, that's going to become an impediment. So sooner is better than later, um, perhaps for physical reasons. So is, is it easier to convince a person um, like myself um, and my husband who were both very involved in moving our mothers out of their big family homes when um, we had a very short deadline? My mother had just gotten this, uh, she was on a waiting list for a retirement community and got a call and said, we've got a place. Yeah. And now we were just in full gear. My husband's mother um, went to assisted living after breaking a hip and he was the only sibling able to help. And that was, that was, you know, that was something we'll never forget. So are people like us more um, apt to be convinced easily to start ahead and, and start planning, um, just having been through it with our elderly parents? I'll tell you what, most people are not going to do this in advance, even though it would give them a lot of flexibility if they had to move or wanted to move. You know, that the place is cleaned out, now I can think about moving and I can take advantage of um, opportunities that pop up. Most people are not going to do it and there's a good reason for not doing it in advance is you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you don't know what will fit, what you should, um, what you should take. Um, what, what do you suppose is the first thing that people think about, oh, I'm moving and I'm moving there. What's the first thing they think about what they can take and not take? Kathy, what do you think? The very first thing? First thing on their minds. Uh, the, like the the anti like the heirlooms, the things that have meaning. No, no, no. Oh, no. Beds, no. beds, Kathy. Oh, beds. beds. Well, okay. Beds. They work through beds. What's after beds? TVs. Dining room table. Oh no. Room table. Major for and people work through major furniture, and you can't do that unless you know where you're going. For can I take the bookcases? Can I take the cabinets? Will I need yard materials? For example, will there be room for my workshop for my uh, painting hobby and so on. People wait to see where they're going and then that can guide their, you know, their divestment decisions. So there's, there's a good reason for waiting until the last minute. But if you wait till the last minute, um, you were talking about a short term, short term process. Most of the people that we, um, that we interviewed, uh, about 34% of them downsized in less than one month. That is, cut the, cut the volume of things that you own in half or more in one month. And 72 thirds of them, 75% uh, of them moved within three months. So if you wait until the end, you're looking at about two or three months of pretty intense work um, right there. And, that's, and, and I understand why people wait till the last minute. 
Yeah, I, I'm here to tell you it is intense and, and it's and you have to take off work. And I mean, it is it is uh, epic. And, and I and I really want to revisit the comment you made about going to the niece's wedding and just giving her something that that uh, was yours and as as a wedding gift. Let's talk about the kids, because every every last person my age, with no exception that I talk to about this, say, the kids don't want any of our stuff. They don't want it. They don't, they don't have room for it. They uh, don't like our style or don't like our taste, um, you know, unless it's mid-century modern. And then, of course, you know, bring it on. But um, it's a real problem. And you wrote something, I think, very lovely in a blog post recently about the generosity of children taking something from their parents, something special. Yeah, what you're saying, Kathy, everybody that we interviewed said that. They don't want much or they didn't take much. Um, but people, but I think it's fair to try to give them things to, or to make the offer in, in everything. No, I think when, um, I have a suggestion uh, to adult children that when things are offered, take them and uh, take some more. Um, the true gift here is reception. This is the gift that you're giving. You're giving the gift of receiving things from people. You should be glad that the household is letting go of things and uh, do it the favor of accepting things that are offered to you. I think down deep somewhere, most givers, most elders know that, that uh, they're gonna they're gonna do something with that that I'm not able to bring myself to do right now um, but instead of saying oh that's you know that's not my style mom and it's not my taste and I don't really need it you should just shut up and take it that's my advice shut up and take it and then take some more <laughs> Be affirm affirm that the household is taking this initiative and 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 open your arms and take things if you're married, though, you should straight. You should get this squared with your husband before you take um, entire quantities of things. But right. Well, we're getting some comments uh, from Susan. Um, S Susan says, "Mom never downsized. She's 84 and now in assisted living. So far, I've spent over 150 hours sorting thousands and thousands of papers and stuff, including family heirlooms." very private items as well. Yeah. Huge stress, sad, causes family friction, plus family memories lost. Do not wait, folks. That's it. That's, that's the advice. And it's interesting that she, she mentioned the, the, the thing about paper. Um, so when we think of our possessions, we tend to think of the things that are important to us. Are, we might have a collection of things, or we might, there might be heirlooms and we worry about those, but there is so much paper in a house. It's absolutely astonishing how much paper is in a house. Let me bring this, the screen share back up here. Um, and just, I had a list at the end of this um, there. Um, this, is, this is an example of, whoop, where did I start? Where did it go? This, oh, I lost it. Where does it go? Screen share. This is an example of the kind of documents and records that might be in a, in a house. Um, and you can read through it, medical records, bank statements, tax records, insurance papers, certificates, bills, clippings, maps and brochures, college term papers, and it goes on and on and on. And this is, these are things that cannot be managed by somebody else. They can really only be managed by, by the householder. And um, paper, it takes up such a small amount of space, but it can take hours and hours and hours to just go through an, even an inch of paper. And then there's privacy concerns about bills and tax records and um, can I shred them? I don't want somebody stealing them out of the trash. Um, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done with paper. Paper real, really stops the progress. And uh, Alyssa writes, making the point that it doesn't have to be a family member. Um, my husband gifted a beloved mid-century Braun phonograph to his favorite student a year ago. It was a great experience to see the joy they both felt. Um, again, you're 
social convoy uh, is not necessarily just family, is it? No, it can be. It can be neighbors who might neighbors who might know a lot about have been in the inside of your house and know a lot about it and actually be more familiar with the contents of your house, what's on the walls, than perhaps your children are. People also give things to household workers. A cleaner, for example, or a handyman might find himself given a chair or uh, things of that sort. All, all, all kinds of people would be willing to perhaps receive things. Yeah. So let's talk about um, selling our possessions. So we've given away everything we can. Um, there, we've donated, and a lot of us, I think, do divest clothing or whatnot as as the years go on. And once a year, maybe we'll take a load out to our favorite um, thrift shop. But what about selling? Is that something? I know people recommend hiring hiring it done, but there are ways, especially online now, to sell things yourself. Facebook Marketplace, and in, in my case, was was just great. Although I would caution people maybe not to do that if you live alone unless you have a friend there because you do have people sort of coming over and you can choose to meet on a neutral uh, on a neutral spot but it, do you see more and more of that or is it is it mainly just the you know estate sales and garage sales and about a third of the people that we interviewed sold nothing um, they didn't even try and it might be because they don't like uh, yard sales, they don't like the, the, the labor, the work they have to go into it, but they might also be in a situation where they can't sell things. Um, some of our people lived in neighborhoods. He said, I can't have a yard sale. Stuff would be walking out the back. Don't live in the kind of neighborhood where you can open your house to that sort of thing, or you live in an apartment, or um, it's a time of year that you can't um, do a sale by yourself. So people will try about another quarter of people did sort of like they sold this and that thing. Um, if somebody wanted it or I've got a refrigerator, would you like that? But about half of them really went at it and tried, you know, major selling various things, do it yourself, the, the yard sale, estate sales, auctions, um, that sort of thing. About the online sales, I would say if you've only got six weeks to go or a month to go before you're going to move, don't, no, no, you don't have time to fool around with selling things one piece at a time. The closer the deadline gets, the more you have to think about sending things out of your household in batches. And um, auctioneers, for example, is a batch method. Um, estate sales are a batch method. As long as you understand the ground rules of estate sales in particular. Some people that we talked to raved about them they said those people really knew how to do it, and other people were crabby or grumpy about their experience because I don't, they didn't understand, for example, that um, they might mix in things from some other household, or they didn't understand it would be held, wouldn't necessarily be held on a Saturday, the estate sale. So they didn't understand the ground rules. So the other thing about sales is, you know, to evaluate their success, you say, did you make a lot of money? Now you quoted a sum of money at the front of the program, Kathy. The very first pers person that we interviewed for this whole study, she was an estate seller. That's what she did. We didn't even know this. Wow. She sold everything in her house for twenty-eight thousand dollars. Now the next amounts, there was a few people got something two, three, four, five thousand dollars that they managed to get in one way or another. But most people said, well, it wasn't much, or it wasn't that much, or it was helpful with the first month's rent, or something like that. They said, but even better than getting the money for it was, we got rid of it. It was the main word, rid, R-I-D. We got rid of it. And um, the, there's money, but it, that isn't the, perhaps the main compensation in selling. It's a way that uh, material gets to bu people who want it, buyers who are willing to pay for it. Yeah, and then I, I imagine too, just currently with the pandemic um, on us, uh, upon us, um, sales, I mean, they're having estate sales, I know, around town, but but you don't see as many. And um, even the places I called to prep for this, um, the donation places, the, the Salvation Army that used to have the truck that would come after your sale and take everything away that you didn't sell, 
is no longer running. So, you know, then you've got to have the physical capacity and the vehicular capacity to take the stuff, even to donate it, even if you don't want to make any money. Um, that's an issue. Right. There's, there's work involved in donating, and sometimes you have to make things presentable. I mean, just for out of your own pride, you would want to clean something or fix something that you were going to donate. You, you'd, you'd want to make that um, seem attractive to people at the, at the donation agency. Um, one, one, woman that we, one woman that we talked to, she used to send, she was, she was embarrassed to go to the collection box herself with multiple carloads of things. So she would send a son and then she would send a cousin. So they wouldn't know that she was, she was a little embarrassed to be always dumping her stuff at the collection box. So she would send surrogates or proxies to, to dump th to list things off. And you're, you're right about pickups. We assume that, that all agencies pick up, but they don't always all pick up and they don't pick up everything. And they have their own rules as well. And we had some testimony from some people um, in some neighborhoods that the agencies wouldn't come to even come to their neighborhood. Mm. So, um, so you have to know the, the ground rules. And again, time's growing short, moving in three weeks. Where's that truck? Where's that guy who was going to haul off the, uh, you know, haul off the dark room equipment? Where is he? What's happening? So it's part of the building stress. Yeah. Well, before we open it up to our Q&A from the audience, I want to introduce everybody to Jack and Maureen Altman. Um, I've come to know Jack and Maureen from, hello guys, uh, a couple of other retirement boot camp activities we have going on and um, come to learn that these, you say most people won't do it, but these guys have done it in, and in a really significant way. So I'd like to unmute them if we could and just have them uh, just briefly tell us your, your downsizing story sure. and what made it, no, you motivated you. I'll give it a start and then Maureen can <laughs> correct everything I said wrong. Uh, we've, we've, down, we've actually downsized and upsized throughout our life from our 50s, 60s, now we're in our early 70s. Uh, this is the last time. Uh, but we've, we've <laughs> actually downsized, and sometimes through steps, three times in our lives. Uh, we're now in a 700 square foot house. And uh, from those experiences, I will give you uh, my, what I've learned from it. I, I think, what you own, there are three categories of things. There are collections. Uh, uh, both of us have had some of those. I had at one time, I was, I'm a big Mickey Mouse fan. I had three rooms full of Mickey Mouse stuff. I had 200 Mickey Mouse ties. Um, we learned from friends and have done this with quite a few collections at this point. One of the great things to do, because the collections are more memory than ownership, mm -hmm. take photographs, give them away. And we didn't, we, we did that with Mickey Mouse collections. We did this with Chachki collections. We had a mug collection. Um, there were many things. And we still have the pictures digitized today. You know, we can go look at it and talk to people about. But we didn't have to own the things. So collections is one thing. Uh, I'll call the next group heirlooms, for lack of another terms, things that are, are very important to you or your family. And there were a couple categories. We have a co couple containers of things from keepsakes. my wife's keepsakes from my wife's high school. They tend to be small things. We reduce those to the important things we really wanted to do. And we review them on a regular basis to see that they still mean anything. They're in two plastic tubs in our attic. And that's it. We had items from our kids' childhood, kid, children's childhoods, and we sent them to them. I mean, those are your things, unless you don't want them. All the ornaments we had from our Christmas tree that were their teachers. 
They're yours unless you don't want them. We'll get rid of them. We we don't we didn't force anything on it. There are family heirlooms, and the thing, and I think that's already been brought up by Dave, is they, what's an heirloom to you may not be an heirloom to your children. So it's you have to be open to their decision to say that piece of furniture or rocking chair that you've had for two generations is not as important to us as it is to you. I appreciate what he says about the children helping out, even though they may end up throwing it away later. But I also think that you as an adult should take the attitude. They may want it, they may not. It's only an heirloom if you want it. And the last thing is stuff. It's everything else. And I will absolutely certify that you can't make a decision on much of that until you know where you're going. And there's two quick things I'll say about that. We we were not big sellers. We tried a few things. It's not my stuff. We were big giver or wearers. Um, when we moved here and we're in a house, I contacted, knew we were downsizing. I contacted a huge number of 20 and 30 something friends who were primarily servers and bartenders from town that we knew who needed things and beds. When we knew at that point what had to go, beds went, they had to pick them up. Beds went, dressers went, desks went. We got rid of a huge amount of stuff helping other people out and we didn't, there was no charge for those things. Although many of them would have gladly paid a nominal fee. Um, that got rid of a lot of stuff. And the very last thing I'll say is, depending on the way you like to live, you don't have to get rid of always, um, careful about saying this, everything you think you have to get rid of. We live in a 700 square foot house. Kathy, who follows me on Facebook, will attest that I probably have more plateware than half the people on this presentation. She's seen some of my stuff I've put on Facebook. Um, uh, we still have a lot of things. So if you're willing to, you, you have to decide not only what you need, but what you want what you want, and to, what you want <laughs> to have. And then the other decision in a small space is where you put it. And my kid, and I'm the cook in the family at this point in our life, and our, my kitchen has hanging pots and pans. It has knives on magnets. Very huge, a large amount of my stuff is out. Mm -hmm. If you can't live like that, you have a different decision, but I love it. And it allowed me to keep a tremendous amount of kitchen and cooking and entertaining things. Pictures, you know, the old thing, they should, you should put one picture on a wall, it should be at your eyesight. We have pictures all over the walls, all over the house. Our choice of how to live, but it allowed us to keep collected pictures, paintings, family pictures, more than we normally would have been able to do. I just want to have one thing that I think has been helpful in this particular time is that we have tech. So all those giant book collections, and I know many people love to hold their books, can actually, you can go online and get a lot of things, or you go to Hoopla, or you do a lot of other things. Um, that's, that, you know, and a lot of things you can just, I scan paperwork so I can get rid of an awful lot of stuff. But I really think, I realized one day as I sat in a small space, I, I'm holding my phone or my Kindle in my hand, and that's an entire room of books. So it depends on how you feel. Like I say, some people love the visceral feel of a book, but you know, it is an option. And, it, and it's become a lifestyle for us. Yeah. So we frequently revisit uh, everything we own and adjust what we want to get rid of or what we want to keep. Uh, Maureen is very, Maureen keeps the manuals for all the stuff we have in the house, but she is on it constantly. We don't own this can opener anymore. That manual is going. I'm not always that good. There are things she's, she she's, she's very good. You know, <laughs> pictures, um, the old pictures she has sorted, but all new pictures are digitized and we have them on our computer and we have them, you know, in the cloud. So they're safe. 
Um, and and so we do things, you yeah. know, like that. But it became a lifestyle for us right. because we got so used to right. doing this. So Jack and day. Maureen, Sorry. Um, Janet Moore wants to know, where do you gather with your family in such a small space? Oh, and he has a lot of dinners for people too. Yeah. Um, I said to my daughter one day, I'm so sorry we had to move from the big house because we have teenage boys now squeezed together. We have six grandchildren here. Is it six? Six yeah. of the seven. Six of the seven. But she goes, hey, we don't mind. We're, we're friendly. Yeah. We're all together. We're squeezed. We, we, have a, we were lucky enough to have a relatively large backyard, but between heat and cold, you know, you have a, a limited amount of time there. But we, we have a small, like, I think it's five foot across round table. I can squeeze eight places around that. Sometimes the kids are eating in the living room and whatever. But uh, we do a lot of buffet type of things. Um, but it's accommodatable. We do, we have dinner parties, not as much as we used to. And they're usually limited to either four people or six people, ourselves included. Mm -hmm. There's six course plated dinners, but you can make room for that in, in a small space if you choose that that's what your priority right. is. It's a more casual time As opposed now, to, to something else. We are also very fortunate that we live within four, four right. blocks of our, our two daughters that happen to live here. So we frequently, for big family things, go to their right. house because you know, walk to each other's houses. Well, thank now, you, hopefully. thank you so much for um, for being our model downsizers today. <laughs> um, now I think we're going to open it to um, questions, and I think we'll do this elementary school style, so that if you have a question, just raise your hand, like you're in elementary school. And then we'll find you and unmute you so you can ask Dave whatever is on your mind. So if you have any questions at all. Um, oh, there's one, Susie. That's Susie on deck. Okay, all right. Oh, can you unmute? Susie, I, I think I've got you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Good. Okay. okay, I have a question for Dr. Eckert. Uh, he's spoken with our group, uh, the decluttering women from KU, several times. But one, one of the statements he made, said earlier was that uh, when you're using family and friends to downsize, things should not be held up for inspection. Tell me what that means. I'm, if, if, if I had all my slides out there, I have a headline from the New York Times that talks about sex toys in the attic. Be sure to get rid of them. <laughs> But letters. I'm not a clue. <laughs> but, but but you know, I mean, th things that are things that are private to you, or okay, you wouldn't want to be interrogated about these things. Um, just take care of them privately, and you would have okay. more time to do that in advance. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Do do this, and we will see you. Um, there's a person that does not have a visual. A A McCabe. Uh, in the cave. I'll, I'll go to her and then to John. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, A in the cave, you should be able to, you're unmuted on our end. Got it. Thank you. My name is Anne. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it came as A McKay, but it's Anne. I did type my question in on the chat too. It's very specific about professional books. My husband's an engineering professor. Um, retired and we have rooms full of books and he everything's online now so what do we do with these books we've tried to give them to libraries museums he's got a big collection of Abraham Lincoln books museums don't want them libraries don't want them booksellers don't want them we can't sell them is it just landfill at this point or what you you could contact, have you contacted an appraiser to come in and look at these things? No, a, we have a, not. A book appraiser, um, you could try an auctioneer. They know what sells and what doesn't sell, and they know instantly what sells and doesn't sell. And you might have to content yourself. There might be gems, gems on your bookshelves, and there might be, you're right, stuff that should be in the landfill. 
you try one more time to get it appraised. I know libraries probably don't want something that specific, especially if it's been written in. I, I, I'm familiar with, I'm sh as I'm sure many of you are, the Lawrence Public Library has their uh, book sale. And I don't know where that stands in this season, but uh, they have very specific rules about things they'll take and not take. Yes, that's correct. I can chime in here. Um, the Friends of the Library are not currently taking donations. Um, eventually, uh, we'll get back online, but um, I can send you a contact email unless you may have already tried the Friends, but um, and we can see if, you know, what the timing is and um, what the availability is for taking a large quantity of books. All right, thank you. John? Uh, yes, um, I've never sold anything online, and I'm uh, interested, curious of knowing what's the best way or good ways to do that. I'm I'm not an authority on on online selling either. Um, I I have a friend who could sell a bent pipe cleaner online and get forty five cents for it. I don't know how he does it, um, but. I'm sure I'm, there's there are probably copious amounts of material on the internet that you could look. How do I eBay or how do I, um, I use this app or that app? John, um, well, you know, locally, since the classified section isn't what it used to be, um, I think the most common options are Craigslist which again you know you have to you have to be careful um and then facebook marketplace which is where i sold um all my things and and i really i it, you have to be on facebook which is the drawback to that but um i really sort of enjoyed or not enjoyed but appreciated getting to go to someone's page to see who has inquired about my old hutch or whatever i was selling you can sort of and, and a lot of times being in Lawrence, Kansas, there were, I had mutual friends with that person, although I didn't know them. Um, but I always made sure my husband was here whenever there was a, a pickup or, or something. But um, then I think if you have collectibles, like I collected Polish pottery and I'm divesting myself from, you know, and so you could go to those groups online and Google and see, sell it to other collectors. That's how we, I think we sold an old mower, an old uh, lawnmower. There was a group of enthusiasts online and I found them through Google and posted my ad there for wheel horse enthusiasts. You know, it was a tractor and uh, found our guy that way. Um, and Facebook will have those, those sort of subdivisions too, those little private groups um, too. Anybody else have a question? Susie? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to add something to the responses for Anne McCabe. And that was once you get, you call out the gems of all those books that she has. Um, we have had a number of, of ladies in our group that have then gone up to KU and to that particular department. And a lot of times they will have libraries within the department. Now it's not a checkout basis. And when they've been donated there, they will tell you, they said, these may or may not be returned. And I thought that's a blessing. Just, you know, <laughs> pass it on. <laughs> okay, I'm reading, uh, oh, Mary, okay. Do you see Mary, Kristen? Um, yes, you should be up, Mary. Okay. okay. Can you see me? Mm-hmm. Oh dear. Okay. So I'm in the octogenarian category and I have a bad back and cannot carry very much weight. And I would like to hear suggestions of someone I could hire um, who's young and strong and will do whatever I ask them to do <laughs> without arguing about it. Someone who I could have come once, two, three times a week for an hour or two at a time just to carry things around and maybe put in a car and take off to donate somewhere once things open up more. Um, I'm just wondering what would be a good source of, of a good safe source of, of someone who, who would be in that category. 
Um, we had been talking prior to this uh, program with the folks over at the Douglas County Senior Resource Center, mm -hmm. and they have two people who, um, whose job it is to help specifically with requests like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we, we try very hard here not to be redundant in terms of services and, uh, but they have the resources there. They know, um, they know who the good movers in town are, who the bad ones are, and I will bet you that they could um, assist on that one. I wondered too if anyone, I, I thought about calling KU to, uh, to see if they have students who would be willing to or able to do this sort of thing. I, I just wonder if anybody's had any experience along these lines. Dave? I know that the, the fraternities often uh, have a, a, a community service uh, out, you know, in arms that they might be willing to do this. You might get in touch with the, you know, fraternity or sorority councils. Mm -hmm. They have somebody that does that. I also wanted to add that there are businesses that will help older adults move. Um, they'll come in and do a consultation business uh, basis for an hour, perhaps a few hours or you can hire them to do the whole thing. They'll even move into your new place and then hang up all the pictures. And when you arrive, it'll look like you, know, you never left your old living room. So those businesses are also available. And these people are called senior move managers, senior move managers. And there is a national network of them. You can go to their website and click on the location that you are. And tell you what businesses there are. I know that they're in Lawrence. I know that they're in Johnson County. Um, I'm not familiar with the Topeka area, but this would be another option. You could pay them by the hour or pay them for a longer period of time, but you will have to pay them. So, so is this someone who could come like one or two hours a week for on and on and on? That's really what I need. Yeah. Um, no, I think you want. I think you just want some a good strong back and some strong arms. But if you want to talk about the entire project, what has to be done, it might be worth talking to them, consulting with them for about an hour. I, I'd hesitate to say what their fees are, but you might expect to spend something like fifty or sixty dollars an hour. But it might be worth it to you because they could give you ideas that would have never occurred to you. Thank you. We, we did have a question in the chat from Cyrus about what is the best method for determining the value of items online, specifically toys? Well, has anyone done that? I mean, I, I've tried that on eBay. So with something, you know, like antique toys, you, you can go to eBay and put that in as a search title, antique trucks or antique dolls or whatever you have and you can get some sense of what things are selling for um sometimes they'll just have a you know a reserve price and sometimes there will be active bidding um and then the other thing i would do is call our downtown flea market and ask them who the vendors are specializing in toys and get in touch with that person and we will have all this uh, on our website um, in the next few days, so you can check back uh, for the resource list. And also, again, I'd say auctioneers um, who mm -hmm. are very skilled at knowing the value of things mm -hmm. or the sale, the sales value of things. John? Yes, uh, to Mary's question of who who she hires. Um, I, I just have a neighbor kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a college student and I pay him 15 bucks an hour and he helps move my yard work. Mm -hmm. He knows more about my yard now. He's been doing it for a couple of years. I tell him to do something. He says, well, you want me to do the one in the back as well? I mean, he actually knows my, knows my yard now, mm -hmm. but you know, he's just a neighbor kid. Mm -hmm. Good. Very good, yeah. Mary, if you check the chat, you can see a couple of people have made recommendations, specific recommendations to you with okay. email addresses. So okay. uh, open up that chat and see if you can't uh, jot down that email address and 
you have some leads. You have two leads. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Um, Susie? Oh, we need to unmute Susie again. You, you, you should be unmuted. <laughs> I just have one comment. Uh, another place that she might seek assistance would be through um, the next door site. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's just Lawrence, or she could narrow it down to just the community of Lawrence that she lives in, i.e. Indian Hills, Sunset Hills, that type of thing. And you can, you can ask for help. Most of the time you get high school, college kids that are looking just to make an hourly wage. Thanks, Susie. Is there anybody else here that um, has has downsized at least once um, and lived to tell about it? Mm. No, I guess that's why you're all here, huh? Mm. Oh, Joy. Okay, you should be able. You should be unmuted, Joy. Are you there? Oh, there you are. Okay, we can hear you now. About uh, a year and a half ago, I moved from a 1,200 square foot home to a 900 square foot home. I have never been much of a keeper, so it's kind of an unfair uh, assessment of what I did because I didn't have a lot to get rid of. My my children took antique furniture, a desk and a bookshelf, bookcase that had glass on the front. They were interested in those. Um, I kept a hutch that I had kept um, pottery in, but now the pottery's in a tub and I'm using the hutch for um, necessary things like light bulbs and uh, cords and things like that that I needed to keep. So it's strictly utilitarian now instead of display. Um, I My biggest issue now is that I have a tub full of photo albums that I need to figure out what to do with. Someone mentioned digitizing. I don't even know how to start to do that. So that's, that's my biggest thing now. I want to be able to digitize everything and so my kids don't have to take these photo albums with them after I'm gone. Uh, again, Dave, are there any services that, that will do that? I mean, do, can people just take a big old box of photo albums? And yes, there are services that do that. And in fact, there, I, maybe it's only in very much larger cities. There's home organizers. They're fo called photo organizers. They will come to your house and sit with you at the table and go through those photo albums. And they'll say, Joy, do you really need three pictures of <laughs> that guy you don't even know who he is? So um, yeah, and, and but photo, you can talk to a Photoshop or look this up online and they can digitize things. Again, there are costs involved. Right. I gave away some furniture to a young man in our church who's a Korean a uh, student and he needed a table and a dresser and chairs so I gave those away. I gave a lot of stuff away. I did use um, the uh, Facebook marketplace for several pieces of furniture but a lot of it went I used the uh, free cycle website that allows you to uh, post things and then people will come and get them or you meet them somewhere and people were thrilled they got my bike and my freezer and things like that that I didn't need anymore and that was free cycle free cycle free cycle that's a good we'll add that to our list well Dave I can't let you go without asking you um, your opinion on someone who sort of took the organizing or downsizing world by storm or semi by storm um, because you didn't mention bringing joy Dave you didn't you didn't mention items bringing joy and uh, I just wondered 
Are you are you just not into Marie Kondo? No, I I, I think I was at a, a convention of home organizers last fall, who have been in the business for you know twenty years, all of them, and they're kind of gnashing their teeth about Marie Kondo. Envious, I think, of the celebrity that she has. Put a, put away all the thing about sparking joy and and speaking to your uh, possessions. She's got she does one thing that all home organizers do, which is she gets everything out. If you get and she advocates getting everything out and looking at it, and until you do that, um, it's just going to lie back there and uh, bother you. You ha and in you know in the period it's period gone by now, people would have spring cleaning because the heating in their house involved coal or involved wood and the whole house would be filthy. And there was a home, 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 or home economist would advocate taking everything out of the cupboards, taking everything out of the drawers and washing the drawers. But in doing that, you get a good look at everything, you understand what's there, and you're more likely to pare down if you're looking at the things. So. In that way, there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of genius in the middle of her uh, television programs and books. Get it out and look at it. But don't tell us you have to put everything on the bed and make a mountain and, <laughs> and lay on it or something I saw someone do. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Is there anybody else that has anything uh, for Dave? Alan, are you, are you wanting to say something? Are you waving goodbye? I've got Jacqueline. I've oh, okay. Hold on. Mute. Okay, yeah, you should be good to go, Jacqueline. Um, I was just wondering if Maureen and Jack could talk any more about how they sorted the old photos and got rid of. Oh, I, I didn't get rid of any of them. Oh, you didn't. You well, just, I, you just I put them, them all in in. Uh, Albums. What had happened is I was very conscientious about mm. uh, pictures and albums as I took them. I mean, going back like 40 years. Yeah. But then we had that acid problem with plastic, and I had to take everything out. And it took me a long time. It was a retirement project, and I just put everything in albums. And I gave duplicates to my kids, and I figured they can take the albums and if they don't, but I did digitalize, some things are digitalized, some aren't. Okay. We, we have, you know, wedding pictures, uh, mm -hmm. event pictures have been digitized, the rest uh, we say, we, but, but Maureen's very good also about putting a name on the back. If we have a picture mm -hmm. and we don't know who it is anymore, uh, we get rid of it. I was gonna. I'm sorry. Oh, it comes from genealogy. It's very frustrating when you find old pictures and there's no name, date, nothing. And I put them on things where I know my kids will go, "Yeah, mom, we know who you are." But that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. We learned one thing when we, when I was in the service, and I think about that a lot now that I'm older. I was in for a relatively brief period of time. I was not a lifer, but we had a lot of good friends who were in it. You know, I was in the Coast Guard, you moved every 18 months to three years. And there was a rule that most of the lifers had. If you moved and had a box, which you hadn't opened in two moves, you didn't open it to see what was in it. You got rid of it. Because obviously it was stuff you hadn't used in two years. And I think that always stuck with me about stuff. You know, we we change kind of change around our clothes every season, like a, uh, a a spring cleaning. And each year when we do that, we kind of look at stuff. And if there is something there I I haven't worn, or Maureen hasn't worn in a year or, or a year and a half, it, there, there's not a reason to keep it. You're not going to 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 use it. So we have kind of a time thing on stuff that isn't used. I mean, we have plenty of old stuff in the house but it's stuff we use. If you don't use it, thinking that one day you'll use it is probably a mistake in our estimation. Thank you. Okay, um, we have, Alan, You raise your hand, Alan, so Kristen can see you. Oh, wait, oh, here, oh. 
Okay. You should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay. Yeah, I just had a couple of uh, possibilities for people when they are trying to invest themselves and stuff that we've used over the years. Could you get a little closer? It's is that, is that better? That's better. Okay. Yeah, just have a couple of uh, possibilities for helping people along these lines. One thing we did after my folks passed away, they had a very long, large china hutch that uh, we actually moved it to our house. Didn't really, didn't have a good spot for it. Had a lot of stuff in it. Had it here for probably a year, maybe a little longer. Finally, between the two of us, Carolyn and I, we determined we really don't want this. And uh, there was a lot of stuff that, my, of course, my folks had collected in there, uh, crystal stuff and silver plate, nothing of any real big value. But uh, it was nice enough. We kept some of it, but it was nice enough that I certainly didn't want to just throw it away. But we just put it on a fairly large table in our house and when anybody came over to our house, they were required to take at least one piece before they were allowed to leave. And it worked out pretty well. <laughs> we got rid of all, pretty much all, everything we wanted to. And there's only a couple of people who were so stubborn. They're still in our basement, but we'll let them out at some, <laughs> some point. <laughs> the other thing, uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, you can rent dumpsters, haul away dumpsters. The city will bring them. They're relatively inexpensive. You can have them put right in your driveway. Uh, and if you're realistic about what really doesn't have any real value, either in terms of selling or uh, taking to goodwill, You'll be, you might be amazed how quickly you can fill these dumpsters up. And you only have to move it one time. You don't need a truck. You put it in there. And when you're ready, you call the city. They come take it away, and it's gone, which is a wonderful thing. And w one other uh, thing, the gentleman who was talking about having something for a year to two years and finding that it's, after a certain period of time, it's time for it to go away. I agree with him 100%. I also incorporate into that decision how heavy an item is. The amount of time <laughs> might go down to six months if I'm having to move it very often. So that's all I had to say. But that's it. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, that is really true with China. You know, China glassware. Um, you start packing that stuff up to move in. It is heavy. So good point. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to tell everybody that um, we meet every Friday morning at 10. Um, it's, just a, it's just a coffee break, we call it. And so if you guys would like to join us um, any old Friday, but especially tomorrow, I think this uh, conversation might be continued um, further. So if you want to be sent your other link, um, Zoom link, just leave us your email in the chat and we'll make sure we get the Zoom link to you in time for coffee at 10 tomorrow. Um, and let's see what else in the chat. Yes, I think we can post the comments with all the resources online. Kristen, can we do that? Yeah, I can download it and we can make a PDF for folks. Okay, and then we will post this whole presentation as well. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's, you know, clearly you were right. It, it is a, a hot topic and there is no shortage of conversation about it. Um, but uh, we will continue on. You can look for the resources online. Give us a couple of days to get that all done. and. Anybody else at all have anything you'd like to say? But yeah, please join us for coffee if you want to. Jacqueline, did you have?
Am I still talking? I can't hear myself. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Well, anyway, that's a, again, Dave, thank you so much. Uh, the book again is called Downsizing, Confronting Our Possessions in Later Life. And uh, the Raven can, I assume, take care of your orders. And then, of course, you can get it through the library on Hoopla. Okay. Should yep. we try to unmute everybody to give Dave a round of applause? Oh. See if we can, Kristen, tech person. <laughs> See if we can do this. Yes, allow people to unmute themselves. Yeah? Yeah. Are you guys all in mute? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Yay! <laughs> okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Hang in thank there. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye.